This episode may contain content of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. I'm Nikki. And I'm Mariah. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Body to Burial. Before we talk about the guests, I wanted to say thank you to Megan. She joined our dispatchers group on our Patreon, and we wanted to say thank you so much, Megan. Right? Megan, thank you. Snaps for you, Megan. Thanks for joining us. I know. So uh, we wanted to say thank you, and we really appreciate it, and we're really excited to have you come aboard. Yay. And let's just jump into this week's episode. Let's get to it. This one is another disposition method. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this one, Nikki. This is definitely one that I had never heard of um, before. And it's called natural organic reduction. Mm. You ever heard of that? Um, Yeah, I think I have. Um, Just because it's been around like the news I think lately is it the the dirt soil soil yeah it's like um human okay. composting um oh okay yeah Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure how that works and I'm honestly not sure how I feel about it <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a big nature person so I don't really see myself being jazzed about being in a like flower garden as some soil I yeah, I don't know. I This one's a tricky one because I feel like I'm more of like a collector and like like I like to like I like be in a place. I like my people in a place. So I feel like maybe this one might be a little tough for me because like what if they get dug up or what if I move? Yeah. And now you're a tree in my house and then I've moved. I mean, technically I'm not the tree because I'm just the soil. But uh, I guess if you're counting, I like grew into the tree. I guess it's just all subjective into how you look at it. Um, but you are the tree now because now like my body just gave you nourishment for the tree. And now you're a tree. And I can't okay. chop you down. No, I mean, that would be less than ideal. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how I feel about this one. And, I, and I'm not sure what the process is that the body goes through to get to that state. So... This one's all full, full of curiosities for me. Right? Yeah. I'm interested mm-hmm. in this because I feel like it's one that it's harder for me to wrap my brain around, but only just because I don't know anything about it. And like all these other ones is I feel like I never heard about them. And then I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I could do that. So I'll be interested to see if maybe um, I can be soiled to then become a tree or wherever I want to go. Yeah. All right, well, let's bring Elizabeth on and have her educate us on natural organic reduction. Why don't you tell me a little bit um, about you, first of all? My name is Elizabeth Fournier, and I am a career mortician. I have been in the death care industry one form or another for the past 32 years. I happen to own the funeral home in Boring, Oregon, which is actually a real place and obviously not very boring. <laughs> it's called Cornerstone Funeral. <laughs> and I'd have to say it's probably the first green funeral service provider for funeral homes in the Pacific Northwest. So I was pretty, pretty excited about that. It's just a repurposed goat barn. And we offered green services about 18 years ago, and no one I know was actually doing that. That's amazing. I guess let's back it up a second. What is... Natural organic reduction. Natural organic reduction would be the same term as natural composting. It's really the above ground composting. It's an alternative to cremation services and traditional burials. It's basically this process that's gentle and it's sustainable. And it's really more environmentally friendly way to honor the dead. We are taking a body and we're doing the same thing we did with livestock a long time ago. The body is placed in a reusable container along with some wood chips and alfalfa and straw and wildflowers, leaves, different things like that. And there's also some other organic materials, and it accelerates decomposition as the container rocks and rotates. And the heat ends up being about 131 degrees. It kills off any dangerous pathogens. And in about a month's time, the body has turned into about two wheelbarrows full of odorless, nutrient-rich soil that biologists really say is unrecognizable 
as far as any microbiology of human remains that's suitable for a garden or really elsewhere on private property. Do the families just take the soil and bring it back to at their house or... How does, the, how does that work? Well, the first state that legalized this process was the state of Washington, and Washington does not allow private land burial. So a lot of people who wanted to have backyard burial or keep their loved one at home are finding this as a workaround. They can have this happen at one of the three facilities that are legal, and then from there they can take the soil home. They can bury it or plant it. They plant trees. They plant it in a flower garden. They make it as a berm or a bedding or anything that you would do with soil in your yard. Um, people are using it for instead of bark dust, just whatever it is to have Brother Bill handy. So it's been pretty fantastic. A lot of people also decide to donate it to a forest where a tree can be buried in that person's honor. So there's a lot of different things that definitely can be happening with this. Wow, that's wild. What are the... I? I don't know if the right word is qualifications, but I know with like, you know, um, the green burials that you can't have the embalming and they try to like remove um, any metals or anything like that from the body. Is that, do you guys have similar uh, guidelines? Embalming fluid is ultimately, it's going to dissipate in soil. But if somebody is choosing a natural organic reduction, they are choosing a natural process and they're most likely not a candidate where a family is going to choose any sort of preservatives. They're going to have someone who passes away. They're going to have them in their natural state and then say, let's get going with this process. So we have yet to Mm -hmm. come across anybody who's wanted to have a full service, um, you know, get into a casket, go into a church, be embalmed. I'm sure that will come up at some point and that will happen. But ultimately, we're trying to break the body down in a natural way, neutralize everything. So the best course of action really would be a natural body. But that's, you know, out for debate, right? Because sometimes we have a a titanium hip, or we have a plate Mm -hmm. in the head, or we have teeth that are filled with mercury. Um, We've had lots of chemotherapy. We've eaten at McDonald's for years and years. I mean, there's no (laughs) body probably that's going to be 100% pure. So again, it's all science. No, it's got a lot of Botox, Elizabeth. (laughs) Yeah, I've drank (laughs) way too much Diet Mountain Dew in my life. So, I mean, I think to say that you are, your temple is 100% godly is probably a myth. So there's lots of workarounds, I suppose. Maybe more time to break down. (laughs) So, but if they do have like metal in their body, they don't have to get that removed no, before this process starts. that will stay. And okay. there are some people who have metal that's been implanted in a way that it really cannot be taken out, such as a pacemaker or a defibrillator. Sometimes people have titanium infused into bone, and it's not something that you're just going to pluck out or chop out. Somebody will completely biodegrade, if you will, and then that's a metal part mm-hmm. that will need to be taken out later and recycled through metal scrap. Do you, like sift through the soil after it's gone through the process to pull out anything like that? Yes, you'd have to because from the soil, when it's left over, you're still going to have bone fragments. And just like cremation, you have to make the bone fragments smaller. They're not going to just naturally break down on their own. Just like burial, if you have a natural body Mm -hmm. in the ground, you're probably going to have a skeletized form until it becomes very porous, very weak, and they break down. Bones seem to last a little bit of a long time, brittle. They're not going to be maybe in their full form but they're still there. So all metal would get removed because people do have screws and pins and all these things. And maybe some kid had a dare from his brother and swallowed a bunch of baby nails. I mean, things happen. (laughs) So we realize that life is not complete. Um, Even though we expect a body to be nude, you know, I think somebody might want to be wearing their favorite St. Christopher medal or someone might have a ring, which we just can't cut off their finger. I think, you know, there's just the allowances for these are human beings. And sometimes again, Again, we're not in our most holy, perfect form as we came into the world. What ha- What about implants? Like like a like a breast implant, would that break down? It would. I mean, there's no like, saline in there, so that's a water-based product with salt, so that would probably break down. And now it's going to be probably encased in plastic. I'm not so hip on breast implants. All I know is when you cremate them, they explode, which is, you know, that's not oh, a good really? day at the crematory. But it's going to be in some <laughs> sort of an encasement in there. So that's not going to be a natural biodegradable material, I don't believe. But plastic doesn't really break down in the soil as well? 
right? Like not really? Well, a lot of it's going to break down as much as it is because it's basically outside. It's tumbled. We're going to have some Mm. heat. We're going to have some natural elements and things will break down. Just like if you have a polyester shirt and somehow it gets left out in the woods. I mean, it's probably not going to be in its purest form. Things are going to break down. But, you know, people sometimes have veneers. We're certainly not going to pick the porcelain off somebody's teeth before we put them in the (laughs) vat. So life (laughs) will just happen. Um, This is a relatively new process in the sense where it's only been legalized for about the last year and a half in Washington. We now have the legalization and it's up and running in Colorado. And then here in my state of Oregon, this is now legal. So there isn't a whole bunch of this going on daily, but it does happen and there is progress. And again, just like we found with Dr. Fauci and the virus, you follow the science because science is really what changes all the time and what we learn from. How come it wasn't legal? Well, somebody had to study it, come up with it. They had to endorse it. They had to put it on the books, all those sort of things. So it wasn't that it was bad and horrible. It's just that idea, And even though livestock have gone through an above ground green burial, which ultimately that's what natural organic reduction is, it's just someone hasn't taken it by the horns and said, okay, let's really see if we can get this as a legal form of disability position for humans. A lot of people say, I want a Viking funeral. I want to go ahead and put my loved one on the lake behind me in the little canoe or rowboat, and I want to push them out, and I want to light the the arrow. Well, Minnesota is looking at that now and realizing, can we have Viking funeral, or whatever you want to call it, outdoor pyre on a lake to be a legal yeah. form of disposition? Because really, it's a matter of you ask and you shall receive. Voices are heard. How come they have Starbucks on every corner? Because because the people want it. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned that the body is exposed to natural elements. Is it in an enclosed box? Like, what does it actually look like? So it's going to be a cradle. It's an idea okay. of a rounded wood cradle. There is a lid. It's monitored. It's not opened. But you're going to have wood chips and alfalfa and other organic material, meaning protozoa and bacteria, and fungi. And so all those things are found in mushroom spores. Those things are all found in Mm -hmm. the woods. I mean, we were not shopping at the Five and Dime and buying packaged protozoa. This is all natural elements that we're finding in bark dust and different things. And there's a place out in Washington that takes care of this called Herland Forest, and they make the mulch and the chips, and they get it from trees in different places. So this is nature going into nature for an output of nature. So you or getting into the elements because, again, this is a tree or woods or something that's been out in the elements. I thought you meant like exposed to like rain or something. So that no, helps clarify no. what, oh, good. what I'm yes. thinking in my head. Okay. Right. Happy to clarify. I was thinking that too, just like like with all that stuff on top, but just like in the open. <clears throat> where oh, Right. Right. Like we decorated you and just sort of walked away. <laughs> no, there's uh, definitely a... Um, kind of a cradle, um, a grave, an above-ground entombment, and it's something that can rock back and forth. Now, also keep in mind there are two entities of businesses that do this in the state of Washington that are more like warehouses. It's more industrial. It's more of a stainless steel sort of container. So that's quite not as sexy because you're inside and you're doing your thing, but you're definitely sealed off. You're definitely the only person, but... um, You know, some people don't like the idea of being inside as it is. It's almost like being in a mausoleum, if you would, where kind of doing it outside in the cemetery and a beautiful burial ground seems a lot more interesting and savvy in my eyes. Are families coming like before the the process starts? Are they coming and having like a service or do they do that before they come to you guys? That's a great question. So it's everything and more. Humans are very interesting and very creative and oh, so very diverse. So some people want to be completely hands off and they want the funeral people to come get their person and then bring their person and then maybe tell them once things have happened or maybe not because again, 
Some are interested, some aren't. Some really want to be there. They want to even provide their own transportation. There is many states where you can drive your loved one in your own vehicle. And so that is something that can happen. And some people feel like they want to do as much as possible for their person. Some want to be there during the laying in process of their loved one in one of these cradles. And other times um, they say, hey, licensed funeral director Elizabeth, Please take Mama and or Peepa or whomever and uh, take them out to the forest and do your thing and maybe let me know the day and time so I can light a candle. So it's uh, all options are aplenty and are available and people do what they'd like to do. When we were talking to the the natural burial, um, Nikki had brought up a point that like she really wants to like uh, put mementos like a picture or a blanket. Are they allowed to put anything in with the body? Naked, 100% okay. naked and nothing else. So this would not be the process if you wanted a certain space to decorate. This is the place mm, okay. where you know that your person is going to become a different form. And then at that point, if you want to gather up the soil or you want the soil delivered to you, then you're welcome to place it wherever you'd like on your property and you can make a shrine. You can bury it in the ground and make it a grave. You can do whatever you would like to do because it's no longer a human. It's no longer human remains. It's now the output. Just like cremated remains, if you're going to bury cremated remains on your property, that's no longer a human. That is the output of a final disposition, which has happened at the crematory. So you're welcome to do what you want. And people sometimes bury a whole urn in their yard. They scatter it at sea. They do whatever they want. How many people do you do like say a week? Is there like a lot that are now moving towards this type of burial? So I am a funeral director who can help families do whatever they want to do. So far, I have had seven families who have wanted natural organic reduction, and that's been since December 20 of 2020 when the very first one happened. So it's not huge. This isn't a weekly process. I don't know, I don't know if you know the answer to this. How many can they um, decompose at one time? Like how many chambers do they have? Yeah. So there is a place called Return Home, which is outside of Seattle, Washington. I think they say they have about 75 of these spaces. Now, if there are 75 people in them, then they have to wait until it happens. I tend to use Herland Forest just because my family seem to like the outside nature of it. It's also 80 miles from downtown Portland, so it's much closer to me. That man currently has six cradles, and people are in them, and it works out just fine. He can build cradles as he needs because he has 200 acres. He can, he can do a lot of things. And so in this case, again, people are interested, but there isn't a, a waiting list where people are dying to get in. That was a joke. You can laugh. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if they were full, though, like, and I wanted to do it, would I just hang out at the, like, the morgue until there was a cradle open? You would hang out in refrigeration most likely at the funeral home that you chose to help you with your process. And the reason why I say most likely is there are 40 states in the union that say you can act as your own funeral home and you don't have to hire a funeral home. And some people choose to act as their own funeral director, so they would have to find sufficient refrigeration on their own. If you're using a funeral home, then yes, by all means, you would hang out in their refrigeration. How do you think that people will start to like catch on to this? Is it just like a word of mouth? Really, people who are searching out articles and watching things on YouTube. And what really makes it really pop is if somebody famous has this process. You might remember about a year ago, Luke Perry, who was on 90210, the Beverly Hills show, yeah. passed away and he chose this mushroom suit and had spores and fungi. And, you know, it's, it's part to really get the party started when you're buried to accelerate green burial. And that got people really talking about it. So that helps. Um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who passed away recently, decided to have a simple 
natural casket inside the basilica for his prayers and before his massive Christian burial. And then he went on to have an aqua cremation. So people said, if Bishop Desmond Tutu is doing this, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So I think (laughs) that that really helps when people of fame do something. People really sit up and take notice. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, this is like a a random grotesque question, but what about like the smell? Is it horrible smelling when you have 30 plus people just sitting in these little pods? I'm going to assume so. I've not been in either of those buildings. And the reason why, one doesn't allow the public or even anybody in the funeral sector in. So I've not been in because of that. And then the other one, none of my families have chosen to use it. So I'm going to assume bodies hanging around trying to compost themselves. Yeah, probably a bit stinky. That's why also I'm another big fan of Herland Forest out in the woods because it's open air. And the times I've been Mm -hmm. there, I ain't smelling a thing. Fresh as a flower. Right. So works for me. Death isn't pretty, ladies. It really isn't. (laughs) I (laughs) mean, yeah. No. My mom passed away a year ago. And so just, I mean, I, the process of it was, um, not pretty. And I imagine your process isn't as glamorous as it you would want it to be. It is hard because ultimately this is about love. It's about loving the people in our lives. It's yeah. about finding some way to do something with the body of that person in a respectful way that will serve a greater purpose. And maybe for some people that is putting them above ground in a mausoleum. Other people say, no, no, no. He loved the grand Cooley Dam and how wonderful to cremate him and scatter his ashes and he's free as the wind. Others say, oh my goodness, she loved her crunchy cucumbers and her juicy tomatoes and let's put her in the garden. So, you know, we all have our different ways of really honoring our loved ones and their memory. Oh, for sure. My mom's at home and we cremated her. And so, you know, we're not ready to have her go anywhere else. And everybody's different with how they want to, like, honor their their family member. 100%. And I love that your mom is home. I love the idea that she can be right there, a part of the action, and, and smell oh, the yeah. cooking and hear the conversations and watch the TV shows. I think that's grand. And even though I yeah. am a green funeral person, I have learned years back you never blow anyone's candle out. And what I mean by that is whatever anybody wants to do, if they come to me and say, I want mom embalmed and we want the diesel hearse that spills grease all over the parking lot and we want to, you know, buy the most expensive metal casket, you know what? How wonderful. I'm here to serve you because funeral directors need to take their ego and their agenda out of it and say, how wonderful you've chosen what you want to do, what works best for you. How may I serve you? Yeah, because it's everyone's different and everyone has their process. Death is hard. Yeah, I feel like talking and doing these these podcasts has been a little like therapeutic, kind of opens your mind to different, different things and different possibilities that you wouldn't think about or know about. Yeah, and some people are open to asking questions. It's conversation, it's talking about it, and it's realizing that, no, people are all handled gently and lovingly. It's just there's no great way because ultimately someone has passed away and people are going to miss them. I think that there needs to be like more conversations around death. I I know it's uncomfortable for people and it's not something that we really want to talk about or even think about for ourselves. But I also feel like, you know, the more that we seek out the knowledge of what our options are for final disposition, then we can better educate like our loved ones on what we want. Because honestly, like, you know, one of the things that I always think about um, when we have conversations like this is like, I don't know what my parents want me to do with their bodies. I have no idea. And I've never asked and they've never said anything to me. And so it's like kind of one of those things where it's like, I feel like if they were to die tomorrow, you know, um, I would just do whatever had been done to their parents. You know, I wouldn't think of offering these other things because it'd be like, oh, would they want that? Would they be okay with that? Would they want that done to their body. Whereas, so I feel like we get in this like habit of like just doing what has been familiar and like what has been done previously in our like family line versus, 
you know, seeking out the information and really understanding what all options are available to us. That's brilliant. And you are 100% right. That's what happens. People don't have the conversations because it's uncomfortable. Someone dies and they say, well, we'll just do what we've always done or we'll just do what somebody else in the family's done. And it's a good idea to at least find out would someone want burial or cremation? Because those are, there are several options. There's burial at sea. There's, um, you know, different things, different ceremonies, but at least the concept of burying or the concept of cremating, no matter what version you use, those are really the two major choices. And just having that idea takes the burden off of you because if it does happen suddenly, you'll never have to wonder, did I do the right thing? Yeah, because like if you're in the grief stage and then having that second like, oh my gosh, is this is this the right choice? Should this be the way that I'd handle this? Like I just couldn't imagine having those feelings on top of already like going through grief. But anyways, one of the questions I was going to ask you is how much does this cost? If you can bury somebody in your own backyard, that's extremely inexpensive because you're just paying for the gas for the backhoe and maybe pizza for the neighbors that are helping you. (laughs) What I know is I can quote what we do here locally in the Pacific Northwest. The forest that I tend to go to, Herland Forest in Wakayakis, Washington. It's so fun to say that, Wakayakis, Washington. That's about (laughs) $3,000. There's two buildings that are up by Seattle. There's the um, Terramation place, which is called Return Home. There's also Recompose, and they're both in the Seattle area. They're about $5,000. Keep in mind, there's probably fees on the funeral home end, meaning what the funeral home does or a funeral director does is that's from the moment someone passes away until they are driven through the gates to the crematory, the cemetery, the 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 resumation place, the uh, natural organic reduction facility. Funeral director does all that before they do the body care, the transportation, the refrigeration, the paperwork. So there's going to be a funeral home, funeral director or not involved who does all that. And then there's going to be the place of disposition, which is technically going to be a cemetery or a reduction facility and they have their cost. So two costs to keep in mind. That's not legal in Tennessee where I am. So what happens if I wanted to do this method? Could my, would, I guess my family would have to pay to bring my body. Can they even do that? Yep. So the least expensive way to do that and the easiest is you fly on Southwest or Delta or American (laughs) Airlines where you do not need to be embalmed. And so we put you in the cargo hold and you don't have to be embalmed. You're not in a casket. And we have people flying all the time. It's just amazing. I've met such fascinating people, just like natural burial. I always thought, well, it might just be my very first natural burial was a group of people who lived in an intentional community. And it's a woman named Wanda who was a wanderer. And she just sort of, you know, was a free spirit who lived in this place and lived in a teepee and died there and wanted to be buried there. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe this is what green burial is. And then I found out I was dealing with a lot of Asian families who wanted this and Muslim families who wanted this. And I was dealing with people all over the board of race, creed, wealth, uh, socioeconomical, everything. And it blew me away. All the people who had a natural burial interest, I find the same thing with the water cremation. And I find the same thing with the natural organic reduction. I've seen all ages, all life situations, and it just is (laughs) amazing because people are fascinating. I would imagine that would be interesting to see because my perception when I had first heard about like green burials was like, like you said, the lady in the t- in the teepee and I'm like, and that's what I picture, <laughs> you know, so it's interesting to see that it's not just the lady in the teepee. No. And you know who's a huge fan of natural burial is Pope Francis. So there's a lot of devout Catholics who like natural burial. So it, it's just mind blowing. What about pets? Because that's another thing I'm curious about. Is it solely just humans right now? When we have burial disposition um, forms for adults, well, not adults, actually humans, and for pets, they're separate. So if there is a pet funeral home, it's absolutely separate. You can't use the same cradles, the same machine, the same spaces for that. So we do have a huge difference between human remains and pets, just so you know. 
So sometimes someone okay. will have Muffy, their favorite tall poodle, on the fireplace mantle, and Grandmama says, "When I pass on, I want to be buried in my, you know, my fifth wedding dress, and I want to have Muffy under my arm." Great, that's different. We're burying the human in the human cemetery. And we're just merely, and Muffy's name is not going to be on the headstone. And we don't, we don't actually acknowledge that Muffy is there. Just the family knows that. Consequently, the same thing, too. If you've got a pet cemetery, you know, you can't have the, the lady who owned the dog there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that movie was my first scary movie I've ever seen. So, yeah, it did ruin uh, pet cemeteries <laughs> for me. <laughs> what about, um, I'm assuming it's okay, but, like, I'm an organ donor, so... I'm still cool to come and be turned into soil. Yes. Now, as long as they could go ahead and procure the parts they need, we call that harvesting. If they could take out your, if it's going to be your eyes or your tissue or your long bones or whatever it is, they could take that. They could just give you a quick stitch. And a lot of times stitching is done with, it can be a, more of a cotton stitch. doesn't always have to be nylon, but that's fine if it is. Then we can put you in the cradle and take care of you. Sometimes okay. when people are donated to science, they have to be embalmed first because you're getting used used for different processes. We want to make sure the embalming isn't there. And just a notice about the organ donor, sometimes people will have a loved one pass away and they'll say to me, oh, well, on the license, she was an organ donor. And what that really means and why that designation is there is because if you all of a sudden have your life cut tragically short, car accident, ski, a tree gets in the way while you're skiing, you still will have vital organs that might be in the prime of health that can be taken out within 12 hours and given to somebody else. If you are 80 or 90, your body is slowly dying. So guess what? Your organs are dying too. So if you've died, your organs, no one, no one wants your heart, no one wants your rumpled up kidneys, you, you've died. But you yeah. still have skin that can be grafted. You still have corneas. You still have wonderful parts that possibly can help 50 different people. But major organs are really, if you're healthy and you are, your cessation of brainstem activity happens suddenly. I was just thinking about this because, I, like I said, I'm an organ donor, but I don't want to be embalmed and, like, donated to science. So is there somewhere that, like, you designate what exactly you're willing to donate or let them harvest? So your family has to give permission. If you're an organ donor and they you're in the hospital and they say, oh, look at this. She has this uh, donation. We found her in the database. Your family has to give permission for them to take anything out of you. And okay. so you cannot be embalmed without family signing the embalming authorization, just like you can't be cremated without family signing a cremation authorization. Nothing magically happens to your body behind the scenes. Your family has full control. I also tell people <laughs> one step further, if you go to a funeral home and you don't like how they're answering your questions, take your body back. You don't have to back up to the holding facility with your pickup truck, but you have the right yeah. to take your loved one to a different funeral home. It's your loved one. That body is your property. I think that's important, too, to know is that, like, you have choices and you don't have to just go to the closest one to your home. And if you're there, like you said, and it just doesn't feel good and it doesn't sit right, you don't have to stay there. No, um, it's not like school district. You can actually go across <laughs> the line to, to the next school if you want to. So that's you can really do that. You can shop. You can ask questions. You can visit. You can do what you want. And if somebody gives you a bad time, move on. This is my other question about the soil. Like, let's say, you know, a family member didn't want the soil back. And I know you had mentioned that it can go to, like, forests or different areas. Is there anything... Um, that regulates where it can't go? So that is a great, great um, question. And the reason why is because there is processes to evaluate the soil and make sure the soil material historically can go to farming communities, um, can do these things. And they found out through processes and through checking things out that, yes, the livestock remains that could be composted, could be used for farming communities, and okay. that you could do this. So what we are telling people at this point, just because we don't f fully know, is if you want somebody to go home with you or you want to do something with the soil, consider not burying it 
where you're going to have a food source. So maybe not in your edible food garden, but maybe in your flower garden, your plant garden, maybe in your forest, your meadow, you know, your yard whatever. Mm -hmm. So just again, because, and I think people also just have the whole yuck, gross out, freak out concept of, oh my gosh, you know, (laughs) if I'm eating a, if I'm eating a kumquat, you know, does this have peepaw in it, you know? So um, (laughs) I would just feel bad if my, if I turned my loved one into soil and I, I was thinking about that, like what happens if whatever I plant with my loved one, I would be sad that like I killed it. And now, you know, like <laughs> I would definitely I, kill it. I can't keep anything alive. Yes. Yeah. And that's a really great question because there's a lot of products on the market that claim you put the ashes in here and you can grow a tree. And people tell me all that time, Oh, I want to buy one of those things I saw on the internet where I put my ashes in that root of that thing and a tree grows. And I have to tell people, okay, there's a, some points here. We have to neutralize those ashes. They're high alkalinity. There is a lot of sodium there. Ashes and soil don't really mix and you're probably going to kill a plant. So there are ways that you can neutralize this. You can spread it out. You can plant it low enough, whatever it is. And also we need to get a plant, a bush, whatever it is as part of the region that grows in the area. So I had a friend who was making these wonderful bio urns and it's a cloth sort of satchel and it has some neutralized soil in it, which helps with the ashes. And then she had plants and she partnered with the Arbor Society. So um, the Arbor Foundation, I believe it's called, and you can get a tree that grows in your region. And the main problem is if you decide, oh, you know, Mom was dying from hospice, well dying, well, dying under hospice, and she was in the living room, and she looked out this one window, and she loved looking at this, this plant, and I said, Mom, someday I'm going to have an apple tree there in your memory, and then you decide you're going to put all this ash, dump it in the ground, you're going to plant this bulb and make your apple tree show up, and the apple tree never grows, you have two deaths. You have the death of your mom, and now you have the death of the memory or the plant or the apple tree or whatever, and how sad, how absolutely tragic yeah. and horrible for people. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So if you were going to bury a tree. For instance, if you were going to donate your soil back to Herland Forest, they know specifically what kind of trees grow in that area because of the high climate, because of the snow, because of the, you know, the lack of sun, whatever. They know what grows there and they'll let you know, this is what we're looking at. What would you like to do? This is what grows here. So they're educated. They're smart people. They know how to use a drainage system. They know how to get the water down deep into the root section and make that happen for you. And you can count on that you're huge human is going to have a wonderful human tree someday. So, you know, just like anything, if you take it into your own hands, do lots of reading, check it out. Don't just go all willy nilly and decide I'm going to plant a lime bush if you live in Northern California, because yeah, not a lot of lime bushes growing there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, is there anything that we haven't asked you about this that you feel like you want to share with us? Yeah, I'm just going to say, just be gentle on yourself. I think when it comes to death, dying, grieving, I think it's really important to drink water and be surrounded by people who lift you up and say nice things to you. So I'm, uh, even though I'm an advocate for the natural organic reduction, I am a provider of death care first. And I think, again, it's just so important that we love each other. We are all in this together. And the pandemic truly taught us that, that uh, life is hard. So, and, you know, do know that even if somebody is listening to this saying, I want to have that natural organic reduction, but your family shoots you down because it sounds too weird, or this isn't legal anywhere near your home. And you would have to have the added expense of someone driving you with ice packs in a van, or you'd have to get on an airplane. It's okay. Be gentle on yourself. There are many other green alternatives out there. I wanted to also add that right now, again, legal in Washington, Colorado, and Oregon, but there is the movement right now, and it's getting on the ballot for Delaware and Hawaii and Vermont, Maine, New York, Illinois. So a lot of states are on par to get moving with this and make this happen. So it'll be coming to a neighborhood near you, possibly. (laughs) Perfect. I love it. I love it so much. All right. Are you going to be soil or not be soil? (sighs) It's a toughie. Um, 
I don't, I don't know because A, I don't know. Like, first of all, I have a really bad green thumb and I feel like everyone else in my family like doesn't like, like besides like my dad and my mom would make things thrive. But like, what, what if I, you don't, I don't thrive. And then now I, I'm just like a waste. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, they don't have to put you in the garden. They could still keep you in some sort of urn. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. I actually didn't even think about that because I was just thinking like soil. Soil goes in like like fertilizer or something, like mulch. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's with like with any disposition method with ashes or, you know, the soil remains, you will, you know, you'll scatter them when you're ready doesn't have to be immediate. Okay. It doesn't, you know, come home from the funeral home and straight into the garden bed. Okay. Yeah, but then some people do. Yeah, so some people do. Yeah. No. Yeah, if you think of it that way, then yes, I'll probably be in an urn for a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to turn into a fern or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess what always surprises me about, um, like, green burial and this option is it always sounds more peaceful than like my imagination made it out to yeah. be before. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Like like the little cradling and like just kind of peacefully transitioning through and letting the bacteria do its thing. It doesn't sound, you know, awful. It's, it's a long it seems like a longer process though. Yeah, definitely a longer process for sure. But it's a gentler process. Yeah. With Little to no, you know, carbon footprint. So that's a selling point. Yeah. And maybe like my other problem is, is because we've also, like I said, no one's ever been like buried in my family. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. my visual is harder for like burial. And maybe it would be harder for this because the process is so much longer. Could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. Because you know how I have that like problem with like them being alone situation. So I feel like... Yeah, I feel like that might hinder my my um going this route is cuz then I'd be alone for like a while. You wouldn't get their remains back for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah. don't like that. Yeah, I, I mean that's like an that. interesting point cuz I I definitely didn't think about that, but um I know my other friend who uh you know had a loved one pass definitely ha- echoes your same feeling of like not liking them at the funeral home. You know, this is a good, good one to think about and a good one to definitely do some more research on if it has piqued your interest. If you have questions for us or for Elizabeth, feel free to reach out to us. Um, We would love to help get those answered for you if you're curious about learning more. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Till next time. All right. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We do encourage you to follow us at Instagram at Body to Burial. Hit us up on Twitter at Body to Burial. And you guessed it, you can send us an email to hello at bodytoburial.com. If you have any guest suggestions, just let us know. Please hit the subscribe button or follow button on whatever app you are listening to. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.